morning, welcome. My name's Egan Campbell from Palliative Care Australia in Canberra on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples. Welcome to Thursdays at Three, our regular series of conversations with people living and working at the end of life. Let me introduce you to John St. Martin. John wears a couple of hats. He's a clinical nurse consultant working in residential aged care and palliative care with Hammond Care. He's also part of the team at the Advance Project, one of the federal government's national palliative care projects. Hello, John. How are you going? Hey, Ian. Good to see you. Looking forward to our conversation today. John, your work really points to the role that aged care and primary health can play in the delivery of palliative care and extending people's quality of life. But first, so I'm keen to get to know you a bit more. What led you to a career in this space, in working in aged care, in, in palliative care? How did it start for you? I guess the quick short answer to that one is through a PEPA placement. And for those who don't know, PEPA is a program of experience in the palliative approach and it's one of the national palliative care projects funded by the Australian government as well. And when I was working in residential aged care, I had the privilege to attend an observational placement in the palliative care unit and community palliative care service. I learned and I learned a lot during that placement. Also, I felt a bit envious because they are doing a lot of great things in the palliative care space that would benefit the residents in aged care where I used to work which marks the beginning of my enthusiasm to build my knowledge and skills in palliative care, which complement my passion for aged care. And I'm a firm supporter of palliative care Australia's advocacy that palliative care is core business in aged care. John, had you had much experience with death and dying prior to that? I mean, working in aged care, yes, but had you had much, had much experience? I guess it comes back to my personal experience um, before I decided to do nursing, I, I looked after my grandpa um, who had lots of complex health issues um, and cared for him until um, he died at home. And mm -hmm. I've also witnessed the changes in my grandma, which looking back now, I think probably had dementia um, as with the changes yeah. with uh, over time and was also involved in caring for her um, until end of life as well, which is, yeah that kind of drove, drove me to nursing when I first moved to Australia. Um, the, the choice to do a focus on aged care was like, wasn't a difficult decision to make. It was really where I'm sort of gearing towards to. Yeah. yeah. When did you move to Australia, John? Where did you come from? Uh, I trained as an RN in the Philippines um, and then I was working in an emergency um, in that capacity and then the opportunity to move to Australia arose, and and I when I first moved in I moved to Australia in 2011, I started aged care cert three and tape, yep, and then just to test the water if it's something I can yep. really do, um, and then eventually retrained as an RN in Australia. So I did both training overseas and here. <laughs> Fantastic. We're so glad you're here. And you're at a time, you're here at a time of real change. As you say, coming to Australia in, in, in 2011, here we are sort of um, 12 years down the track, 13 years down the track, and, and a lot has happened in that time. And yeah. as you pointed to, more and more palliative care is becoming embedded within aged care. It was one of the key recommendations of the Aged Care Royal Commission, and it's certainly where the sector is, is headed. What does that look like in, in your world when you talk about integrating aged care and palliative care so that they're, they're more together? What does that look like in your world? Oh, integration is a great word, actually. Um, it's about bringing and sharing the expertise of aged care to palliative care and palliative care into aged care. And Hammond Care has a strong focus on achieving this, with, which is outlined Hammond Care's palliative care strategy as well. Mm -hmm. One of the key focus is on embedding palliative care expertise wherever the client is, whether they are in residential aged care, hospitals, home care, or linked with Dementia Support Australia. My colleagues in ResiCare would probably be able to explain this much better than I can, because in the last few years, Hammond Care's residential aged care team worked hard and put together a palliative care framework that would help integrate and acknowledge the palliative care aspects in delivering aged care. And currently I'm one of the mentors, which is a true privilege. Palliative care is all about um, extending people's quality of life. How do you do that in an aged care setting? 
What does that look like day to day for, for you and your colleagues? I think on a day to day basis, we deliver palliative care in aged care mm -hmm. daily. The principle is the same. It's, we're looking at person centered, we're looking at relationship focus, uh, we're looking at provide, op, providing the best care that would optimize quality of life until end of life. And I think it's it, there's a really there's real importance in acknowledging that palliative care is core to what we do when we're delivering um, aged care to mm -hmm. the people that we look after. Yeah. Is that a challenge in a in a busy aged care environment um, where you've got uh, a, a lot to do and you're looking um, to I guess incorporate palliative care into aged care and and look after people's uh, symptoms and their medication, but also their, their spiritual care needs, their their day to day joy of, of living as as well. What are the challenges for for doing that? Challenges. I think it's a really good one because um, there are a lot of challenges, and I think acknowledging that, like we said, the busy aged care work uh, workplace already. It's acknowledging that we look after the most vulnerable people um, in Australia. And mm -hmm. equally, we look after people with increasing complex health needs, which really brings us to the need to acknowledge that perhaps an earlier conversation around palliative care and how we can address those needs would lead to improving the quality of care that we're providing yes. um, on a day-to-day -day basis. When you talk about having that earlier conversation, how do you handle that that moment, perhaps that that fear that perhaps you see in in a resident's face or in, in their family's face when you start talking about palliative care and and it dawns on them that they're they're moving towards the end of their life. How do you deal with that 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 fear, those questions, that uncertainty that that people perhaps naturally have when you start talking about palliative care and, and death and dying? Hmm. I think it's sharing that space with them mm -hmm. and really immersing myself in that moment um, with them, acknowledging that there's going to be a lot of emotions. And sometimes as soon as you mention the word palliative care, they don't hear anything else. Yes. Um, so I think it's sharing that space and, 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 and being with them until they're ready again to talk. Yeah. Because um, yeah. sometimes it gets so tempting to add more information with Probably one just one bit at a time, hey? Yeah, yeah, one step at a time. I guess speaking of those steps, John, as you say, Hammond Care have been a real leader in the aged care space when it comes to embedding palliative care into your day-to-day -day practice. What have been, I guess, the, the secrets, the tips? What's helped Hammond Care embed palliative care in the services that you provide? What can other people learn, other service providers learn from the Hammond Care experience? I think it's coming back to acknowledging that people working in aged care are already doing palliative care. Um, and to me, palliative care is good care. So it's 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 coming coming back to principles, to the bread and butter of how aged care staff deliver care, which is person-centered, focusing on building trust and relationships mm -hmm. and providing support to family members, which are core cool to how we deliver palliative care as well. So, so all of which, um, sort of can be leveraged in a way that acknowledges that, yeah, I think finding ways to leverage those existing um, strengths already in HK and how we can deliver palliative care to people with complex health needs as well. Yeah, yeah. John, just switching to your work at the Advanced Project um, and, and thinking about that last question around embedding palliative care in aged care and, and, and how to help providers do that. There is, there's some great training available, isn't there, for, for people who've been working in aged care for some time now and, and perhaps need to take that next step with their palliative care training. Yes, certainly. Um, and I guess I could share a little bit about the Advanced Project. Please, yeah. <laughs> so the Advanced Project is one of the National Palliative Care Project, also funded by Department of Health and Aged Care, and Hammond Care is leading this project in partnership with another national palliative care project called Care Search. Mm -hmm. um, this, this, this current phase of the project, or what we call the Advanced Project Dementia, provides free practical evidence-based training and resources that makes it easier for aged care professionals 
to build greater confidence and skills to this to start conversation about advanced care planning and assess the palliative care needs of people living with dementia to enable better care. Since launching actually the new dementia specific um, in August 2022, we've had over 1200 people registered for the resources nationally, which is really exciting for us um, across all states and territories and a range of work uh, workplaces and professional roles too. So feedback has been quite um, positive for the resources, e-learning and the trainer trainer program that's been uh, available. What are some of the areas or perhaps some of the the hurdles that the training covers? What are some of the challenges or questions that the workforce might have um, that this that this training helps them with? Sure. The training, the resource that's available would be some of the resources that I wish I had when I first started working in HK. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is around how do I start conversation around advanced care planning? Um, I, I think I made it bigger than Ben her before I even um, <laughs> during the conversation. So I was making myself really anxious. And that kind of translates to, um, to the person I'm speaking with. Yes. And, and often when I start conversation on advanced care planning, a family, I, I remember vividly this family member said to me, why do I need to talk to you about this? My mom don't have cancer. She's only got dementia. Why do I need to talk to you about advanced care planning? Um, so really focusing that health and care, or that it's an under-recognition that health and care for people living with dementia is also um, relevant. Um, it's not just for people with cancer. That palliative care is, is more than just cancer. Yes, yeah. absolutely, yeah. Yeah. more than just end of life. And the this, this second aspect of the resource um, is what we call the distress observation tool, which is a new tool that we've developed. Um, mm -hmm. We call it DOT for short. The distress observation tool it's a simple tool, but the real motivation for using the distress observation tool is around getting care workers and family members to, um, to be involved and to, to sort of help them communicate the distress they observe to a person living with advanced dementia. Often they see it, they're the eyes and ears, and they know the residents really well, but not escalating it quickly enough or, or early enough because they kind of just don't have the words for it. They've got the gut feel. Um, yeah, yep. it's hard to explain it to say to the RN or to the clinical manager. Um, so that's what the DOT is for. And John, there's a role here for primary health to play uh, as well. That that relationship between the local GP and the local nurse practitioners and that, that primary health uh, sector is really important when it comes to aged care. Primary health has a role to play here too that, that you're supporting them to, to do. Absolutely, absolutely. And the previous phases of the project or of the advanced project have been focused on primary health care um, and GP clinics to once again start the conversation, get practice nurses involved and other people roles involved in the GP clinic to be to be to commence conversation or start conversation around advanced care planning, assess palliative care needs and assess the support needs of family members as well. Um, so this is just really building upon those previous projects. Mm -hmm. And I'll include links to all the great uh, resources that the Advance project has has produced within the show notes, so people will be able to find them really easy at the end of the podcast. And um, yeah. John, perhaps a bit of bit of free advice. We've we've touched on dementia uh, a few times there, and perhaps some misconceptions around dementia. And indeed, more and more Australian families are are living with dementia, either within themselves or their their loved ones are, are living with dementia. But a lot of people are, I guess, are scared of dementia and, and, and how it progresses. What advice do you have when it comes to engaging with people who are living with, with dementia? Often people can feel reluctant to engage with people and, and fearful of engaging with people with dementia. What advice do you have as a, as a fellow who's engaging with people living with dementia every single day? Sure. And I guess there's no one template answer to that one um, because it's good to really see the individual um, yes. and the person you're speaking with. So it, I wouldn't change my approach perhaps um, to say if I'm speaking with Ian um, and versus to when I'm speaking to someone living with dementia. Yes. However, my approach would be I, I tend to go in, if I go into that space, then I live in that world too. If they say to me that we're in a party right now, sure, we are in a party right now, and, and really not go against it. 
um, and really just join that journey. If they speak French to me, I'll try my best to respond in saying we. Oui. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so I think focusing on it's, it, I think to me, it would be going on with the flow um, in the conversation as well, um, particularly for people with advanced dementia. It's really good advice there, John. And it, it, it sort of, the hairs on my neck uh, stand up a little bit thinking about my own family's experience with dementia and this conversation that we were having as a family around, you know, do I correct Nan when she's wrong or do I go with Nan and, and be in her world? Um, and, and clearly you're saying, be in her world, go with it, go to the party. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's often not the words that we say, it's, it's how they felt while we're having that conversation that matters mm -hmm. to them and it's what sticks with them as well. Yeah. And and even though Nan might be, be wrong in what she's saying, there's really no point in, in sort of arguing the toss, is there? Yeah, I think you're just going to make yourself frustrated and probably you're going to make Nan frustrated too. So I think it's best to, to go with the flow if what we're trying to achieve is the same thing, is to have a conversation. Yeah. yeah. John, tell me, the aged care sector has been under such scrutiny over the last five years or, or, or more. What's the mood within the sector at the, at the moment, within your, your community of aged care workers? How are, they, how are they feeling? They've been under so much pressure. How's the sector feeling? I think different organisations would probably have different perspectives perspective on this one. Mm -hmm. And what I find really sort of resonating across many different areas is that despite the challenges that they go through, I find that aged care workers have this great resilience um, and, and really innovative take on things. What, what they do is they, they move forward, they, 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 they put their best foot forward and get on with things despite the challenges. Mm -hmm. it's, it is quite challenging with, with the highly regulated sector um, to almost even do hands-on care because they kind of need to do documentation and all that. Uh, so I think there are resources available, but equally we need more time to actually allow them to use those resources and, and enhance the care that they're already providing because yes. they're already stretched, I think, overall. Yeah. Time is a, a very precious thing, isn't it? Time to learn, time to use the resources and bring them into your practice. Yeah. Yeah. What what role is COVID still playing in your your day to day? Many of us don't have a, a sort of a, a regular relationship with aged care and perhaps don't understand the role that COVID is still playing. How is COVID still rolling out in, in aged care? Yes. So different location would have different protocols. Once again, I think it's just depending on um, sort of protocols that they need to follow. But I've been I've visited places where they still do COVID rat testing before you come in. You need to have a negative, and most places do. Uh, yeah. I think just acknowledging how the environment itself um, it's much harder to contain, um, particularly in areas where people like to interact. And the social aspect is really important. So to isolate someone could really have a negative impact on the person's quality of life. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's something we're all still coming to, to terms with, still still shaping our life and, and our work. Yeah, personally. John, John, tell me, what does working so closely with death and dying, what does that bring to your life outside of work? How does that shape the way you live? That's a really good question. I think for me, it it helps me appreciate the moments that I have um, with family, with friends, and and doing and, and really help me see the bigger picture uh, in terms of what's important to me and why is it important to me, and and really cherish the small things that I have and spending time with people that I care and 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 doing things that are important to me as well. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's, in, in, a, in a greater sense, it helped me appreciate the short, the relatively short time we have in this world. Yeah, yeah. And if you don't mind staying personal for a bit longer, how do you, how do you cope with the emotional load of your, your work? You, 
you're busy, you work hard, it's very physical work, but it's also a very, um, very emotional work. How do you cope with the emotional load of your work? How do you shake that off at the end of the day or the end of the week? <laughs> shake it off. Perfect for the aerospace tourism. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a lot of ways. I think I've come through many different phases of, of my coping strategies. I think I started you know, as a new pal to Kenneth. I started with watching Marley and me because I didn't know how to process my emotion and I just needed to cry. Watching Marley and me, did you say? Marley and me, I'd re that really gets a string. Um, each time I watch it, it's always really effective. Um, and I think eventually it comes down to the support networks that I've got as well. I've got my wife, I've got my family, I've got my friends. But equally doing intentionally reflections and, and finding opportunities for debriefing um, yes. and 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 finding ways that would or finding activities that would refill my cup whether it's going outside in nature um doing new things learning new things like this time i'm learning how to play golf and and my challenge is to read one book a month <laughs> and I, what else i think i'm very lucky in my workplace as well because we've got a lot of activities that prompt these support so we've got this activity called all about you which as the name implies is all about me <laughs> uh, it's a nice forum um, we've got clinical supervision, um, and most recently, with, in my role in the community palliative care team, when I hear the bell in the morning at 8.15, it means it's time for us to do something. So someone would lead a yoga for a few minutes or meditation, read phrases, or watch uh, meditation videos and all that. So that's really, really helpful. But my most favorite one that I do in the workplace is what we call candle and prayer. Candle What's prayer. It? Candle prayer. Candle lit prayer. Yes. So what we do, and I've experienced this, and this is one of my most vivid memories and profound, profound emotionally for me. And when I first started in palliative care unit, is that they put this candle that are not lit, but so it doesn't trigger a fire alarm, but candles, and they put it in the middle of the bed, and at, in the room after a person has died, when when it's all empty and the team surround that bed and we do a bit of sharing whatever memory comes up the sharing about that person share a bit of prayer and i find that really healing um, when we do that as a team because we all care for this person we all grief about this person and yeah i find it really really helpful that's really beautiful you're a smart man john some great ideas there and and even just um, you know your acknowledgement of the the power of crying, the power of tears. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm a crier as well. Always, <laughs> always feel better after after a, a, a good cry. Um, thank you for sharing that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, John, what's your your pitch um, for getting people to work in this space? There are all sorts of workforce shortages at the moment, right across health and aged care right across a range of, of sectors. What's your pitch to, to people to come and work in aged care, come and work in palliative care? The pitch. I think for me, it comes down once again to recognizing that in whatever speciality you're in, you're probably providing palliative care. Um, no matter which area you're working in, where we're praying palliative care, which is the same reason why sometimes I struggle to explain what palliative care is to someone. It's because I can't just focus on one organ or one disease or yes. one age group. It's just so um, broad. Um, so I think to me, regardless of which specialty you're in, you're providing palliative care and be intentional in ways that understanding or recognizing this, the person in front of me right now have palliative care needs. And then this person right now require other referrals or special palliative care referrals. And if you find yourself doing a lot of that, and if you find yourself interested more, then we can have a chat more. <laughs> There's a lot of resources available um, um, through the National Palliative Care Projects that are free that you can access as well. Um, but once again, more than happy to, to have a chat and, and talk about palliative care. <laughs> It's interesting you say that, John, that, that perhaps a lot of healthcare workers don't realise there are elements of palliative care in what they're doing in terms of easing suffering, providing quality of life, um, talking to people, helping them get through. Um, those values cover a, a wide range of health specialities, but, but come together so beautifully in, in palliative care. 
Absolutely. It's not, I think the people's common perception is palliative care is when someone's at the last phase of life and it's not yes. the case. I think we can do a lot more um, before a person goes to the last phase of life. And a lot of times they're doing it, not the specialists are. John, we wish you well. Thank you so much for sharing your work and wisdom today. And here we are talking about stress and how you get rid of that emotional baggage. You're just about to go on holidays and sit on the beach. And we, we wish you well, John. Thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much, Ian. Johnson Martin there, a clinical nurse consultant with Hammond Care and the Advanced Project. You'll find links to all the great resources John mentioned within the show notes. Thanks so much for tuning in to Thursdays at 3, whether that's via PCA socials or Spotify. Head to the PCA website for info, tools and support when it comes to matters of life and death, where you can also make a donation to support our work. See you next Thursday.